Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, good morning, wherever you are. I feel like, like I'm on the Truman Show. Um, Sesame Colloquium, very happy to be hosting Dr. Edward Eddie Melser from the Alternative Learning Technologies and Games Lab at UC Santa Cruz. So these are exciting days of being design-based researchers of uh, uh, mathematics education. There's a rising paradigm in the philosophy of cognitive sciences, loosely referred to as the uh, embodiment term. And it's, um, it's querying, uh, querying implicit assumptions about epistemology, and in particular, the role of perceptual motor activity in, in conceptual learning. I got to meet Eddie a few years ago at an annual meeting of uh, PMENA, which is the North American chapter of the International Group for the Psychology of Mathematics Education, where a bunch of us established a working group on embodied mathematics, imagina imagination and cognition. And uh, us folks are all intent on evaluating the purchase of the embodiment term on the design of digital resources for mathematics education. And games is one type of activity that these resources could support. Eddie speaks of serious games, so I still need to hear if that's not an oxymoron. Like, I'm trying to think I'm playing and I'm, I'm serious. Right? Um, about, about, about Eddie, I'll just read a bit from, from his, uh, apps, his uh, bio. Um, he, he's an independent game developer and director of the Alternative Learning Technologies and Games, ALT Games uh, Lab. He's uh, also assistant professor in the UC Santa Cruz Department of Computational Media. And his primary teaching and research interests are at the intersection of games, human computer interaction, and learning sciences, where he explores the usage of alternative controllers and physical gameplay mechanics to enhance learning outcomes in educational games. It is research in the area of tangibles and embodiment for educational games. Uh, this research has received best paper honorable mentions at, at CHI um, and educational games similarly have won awards in, in venues such as the Serious Games Showcase and Challenge and Games for Learning Design Competition. And his independent games have been featured in a number of premier venues. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Eddie Melsa to uh, to his talk, um, and here I'm switching to see the, the title: "Building Better Educational Games, Exploring Embodied Design Decisions That Impact Learning." So, welcome, Eddie, and please take it from here. And thanks so much, Lloyd, for uh, facilitating and organizing the series. We'll make this happen. Awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dora, for the wonderful intro, and thank you again, Lloyd, for setting this all up. Um, and yes, spoiler alert, it's totally an oxymoron. Serious games is not the right term, but it's the most commonly recognized one. So use it, I guess, when use it with caution. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you all for attending my talk. I'll be talking a lot about sort of these design decisions and a bunch of games I've made, uh, focusing more specifically on this tangible pro learning game for programming. Um, so just a, a little more about me. Um, I direct the Alt Games Lab, and so we sort of do this research at the intersection of HCI games research and learning science, uh, which really means that I focus a lot on how we can take learning science concepts, ideas, and incorporate them into educational games uh, to like inform them and make them more effective, and just sort of see uh, how that can like impact their design. So I think a lot about how we design these games and interactive systems to be more effective. Um, part of also what I do is I do a lot of work with just making uh, games in general, but also educational games that have these really novel physical interactions. Uh, so anything from doing CPR on a stuffed dog uh, to playing ping pong on an augmented uh, ping pong table um, or, you know, playing an augmented reality and learning about what foods to eat with type 1 diabetes, uh, all sorts of things. I call them weird games. It's fine if you call them weird too. Uh, but I make these weird quirky games uh, and I really love it. Um, so just some examples of that. Uh, this is Veterinarian's Hospital Rough Day. Uh, and so it's actually, we, we found like the saddest looking stuffed dog toy we could at like a thrift store. 
took all the stuffing out, instrumented it with sensors uh, and put it back together. Uh, and then the game basically instructs you like different CPR actions to do. So you've got to take the pulse, uh, give it a cordial thumb or actually give it CPR. Uh, and there's like different sensors built into that thing that actually like, detect if you're breathing into its mouth or like taking its pulse or whacking on its chest. Uh, and so it's a wildly entertaining game, not very educationally focused, but meant more for like the fun spectacle of it. Um, this is another one I made called Scene Sampler uh, in collaboration with Catherine Espister and her lab, uh, her set lab over at UCSC. Um, and basically this game is much more about like how we can have people explore social space differently. So we give them specialized instruments that are meant to detect certain sounds uh, and they're told to go find them. Uh, and so they've kind of got to walk around and find like somewhere where it's quiet or somewhere where it's really loud or somewhere with a deep voice. And it kind of encourages you to explore the social events like conferences, festivals, these types of things differently. Um, sort of in addition to, you know, uh, doing this more like independent game work uh, that can or cannot be educational, um, I also do a lot of work with just general educational games. So this is Academical, um, which is a game that I've been working in collaboration with uh, Nora Wardrip Fruin and his lab, uh, the uh, EIS lab over at UC Santa Cruz, where uh, we built this uh, educational narrative game, interactive narrative game uh, called Academical, and it teaches you how to do responsible conduct of research um, by having you sort of role play different characters in different scenarios. Uh, and you know, make these decisions and see the impacts of them. Uh, and recently we got a, an exceptional paper award for this over at FDG, so that was pretty cool. Um, and so sort of the main thrust of my work I'm gonna be talking about today, um, and just my research in general, is this idea of how can we incorporate physicality to make educational technologies more effective? Um, and there's a lot of good arguments for that, like why we should care about physical interaction um, right, this has sort of become a really interesting new trend in gaming. It's been around for a while, but all of a sudden sensors are really cheap and they're very like ubiquitous. They're embedded into your phones. Uh, everyone here probably has a, you know, modern smartphone today, which those come with about on average 12 different sensors that you can use, including your camera, your mic, you know, accelerometer, gyroscope, all sorts of fancy devices uh, that allow for these like novel types of physical interaction. Um, Another thing is that we started to see these are very commercially viable. Uh, so the Wii, which always had that joke that it prints money um, because they just was so massively successful with its like physical interaction uh, devices for the controllers. Uh, and more recently, Pokemon Go. Uh, just out of curiosity, I ask this every time. How many people have Pokemon Go on their phone right now? Are playing it maybe? Best game ever. Okay, so fair number, right? Uh, it's pretty pretty awesome that something like that has become so financially viable. Uh, and this is a great argument. Uh, used to kill your data plan. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and this is a great argument for why um, we should care about physical interaction. And it could actually be a very viable tool to incorporate to better games as a whole and for education. Um, sort of on top of that, and this is like my own personal bias, um, I feel uh, as a designer, it's sort of more satisfying to design interactions that effectively utilize the body. Uh, so this is always the joke I tell people is, you know, when you're making a game, you're just saying press A to have fun and it's not always fun. Uh, and so when you actually bring the body into it, you're doing more interesting things that can be more fun to play or watch. Um, and sort of what we're really gonna get into today uh, there's really a substantial amount of like existing research highlighting various potential benefits of like adding this physical interaction to your, your games and the interactive tools. Uh, so just to kind of highlight some, this is uh, called the, the Mathematical Imagery Trainer. Um, and they were able to kind of do some studies that indicated that this tool uh, would help students uh, improve their spatial recall and mental manipulation. And so the way it worked is you held I believe it was like a Wiimote or something similar, and you moved your hands at different rates uh, to sort of look at ratios. And so you would get actually a physical intuitive sense based on the rate you moved your hand at. Um, so that was a, a very interesting way to kind of use the body to help you develop these more like improved spatial recall and mental manipulation ideas. Um, another one, and I always love showing this one because it's absolutely crazy, um, the embodied puppet interface, where they actually just strap like a physical a puppet onto your body, like it's a little whole giant full body wooden controller 
uh, and you manipulate it to move a virtual avatar. And then you had to actually move the avatar and catch teapots in space by like manipulating this wooden body. Um, and they were able to show all sorts of interesting things and actually show that it, it improves spatial recall and mental manipulation. So very, very, very interesting uh, tool there. Um, there's also just a lot of work showing like when you design a physical interface that's customized for learning, you tend to get more intuitive and efficient like interfaces and mappings uh, and interactions that you can like customize based on what you want it to do, uh, which is always very helpful. Um, and this is probably one of the most common ones, which is these types of physical interactions and in games tend to improve, you know, positive feelings towards learning concepts like science, STEM, all these types of things. Uh, this one's called the interactive slide. Um, and they were able to show that, you know, by roll, going down a giant slide, kids had more fun and enjoyed what they were learning more, um, which I would certainly hope so, or something was probably wrong <laughs> with the design. Um, but this is a really like awesome example of like a really fun way to engage kids in learning content. Uh, but sort of while I'm talking about these, you may have all sort of noticed this one key thing, which is when we talk about we want an educational game covering X, it kind of goes in this black box of design decisions, and then out could pop something where you have a giant slide, or you're playing with stuffed animals, or working with tangible blocks, or suddenly you're moving your body in front of a connect. Uh, and really, there's this weird black box of design decisions in academic literature that doesn't get into a lot of what's happening here to make these different types of games and why these choices are being made to teach certain types of content. So uh, when you kind of dig into that box a little more and you at least try, try to see the terminology uh, that people are using, um, you see terms like embodiment come up a lot, embodied cognition, embodied interaction, uh, every variation of embodied on something you can kind of find. Um, full body learning, uh, interaction, kinesthetic learning, the list kind of goes on. Um, but really it's sort of that idea of embodiment that's very interesting um, and was a lot of my study in past years, uh, but it's kind of a little bit of a fuzzy term, which I think many folks here who are dealing with embodiment have sort of understood that and have bashed their heads up against it as well. Um, so I come from the world of HCI uh, and we sort of describe it as this, uh, the way physical and social phenomena unfold in real time and space as part of the world we're situated in. Uh, I think what Dora was sort of talking about is much more like in the learning science community, we think about like the perceptual motor and how that sort of serves as the framework for our understanding and interacting with the world. Um, cognitive science, so Lakoff and Johnson, all their embodied metaphors, these different levels of embodiment, at the, like the neural, the cognitive unconscious, and these types of things. Uh, neuroscience, when neuroscientists are talking about embodiment, they're talking about partial reactivations in the brain that are recreating a memory or an event. Um, and there's actually just papers talking about all these different uses of the term embodiment across different research domains. Uh, and the problem is, is that that makes it really hard <laughs> to know how to design a system when we want it to be embodied, uh, what it means to be embodied and how the different choices we're making like, impact it. Uh, so we really need this more systematic way to analyze, design, build, and really evaluate these physically embodied systems. Uh, and so one approach I actually took um, was creating this design framework, uh, which design frameworks are really nice tools um, in like the HCI and software community where they kind of bridge conceptual differences between existing systems and domains. Um, and so they're really great because they, you know, provide this sort of structure for you to classify what the different decisions were made in these systems and how that might impact things. And it also lets you uh, sort of categorize what ex exists, differentiate these ideas, and then more importantly, really identify the unexplored terrain, right? It's very generative. So it helps you kind of think of new areas to go into with your designs, which could be really interesting. Uh, and so what I did was I actually conducted a pretty darn extensive literature review, which uh, drove me nuts. Um, in hindsight, very glad it's done. Um, and sort of looked for all these examples of embodied learning in games and simulations. And so I focused most of my work within the HCI community because that's where I am and incorporated some learning science journals where I know for sure they have do publish work on these sort of embodied games uh, like Computers in Education uh, or British Journal of Education Technology 
um, but a lot of it's focused on like game-based learning journals and and uh, Chi journals and and or Chi and two Chi and these types of like HCI fields. Oops. Uh, and so one important thing I did when I was collecting all of these is I actually only took examples of games and papers that explicitly said embodied. Um, because as I was saying, that term's so fuzzy that if I were to start defining it, I'm adding all this bias in. Um, so I purposely didn't uh, include games or systems, even if they were physical, that didn't say they were embodied because I wanted this very encapsulated view from within the communities. Um, and then I did this bottom up open axial coding of these like 66 different games that I collected over the literature review. Um, uh, and so for it, when I was sort of coding them, I took a very broad perspective to embodiment. Um, this is one of my favorite definitions of it because I feel like it encapsulates a lot of interesting ideas that can be leveraged, uh, which is sort of this idea that human cognition and behavior is connected to our bodies and how they have physical, physical and social interactions with the world. So I think this encapsulates a lot more of like how the social elements can play into our shared understanding and development of cognition. Uh, and so really like thinking about how we're taking things from the brain and we're externalizing that cognition and meaning making into the space and in our interactions with it. Uh, and then I also sort of used that framing to break down how I looked at the system. So I looked at it a bunch, bunch of different ways. So I was trying to look at the social elements. So how were they enabling people to play, right? Was it in single player, multiplayer, different types of communication? Um, how are they actually enacting learning concepts? So what were they doing with their bodies, with the environment, like physically, uh, and sort of what the world that they were interacting with was. So was it a digital world? Was it some hybrid? Uh, was it a purely physical space? Uh, those types of things to get a better sense of how these systems are really being designed. Uh, and so when you do that, uh, as I'm sure many people are here familiar with, you get a super, super ugly spreadsheet um, that you know by some miracle ends up turning into an actual framework or you know, set of ideas. Um, and so I could talk about all of this and everyone's eyes are gonna like roll back in their head. So I'm just gonna focus on uh, physicality for today, whoops, uh, which is the top one. Uh, Cause I think that's the most interesting sort of approaches that you can take towards embodiment. Um, if you're curious to learn more about them, uh, there is sort of papers that I've had on these work at CHI and Foundations and Digital Games Conference uh, that elaborate on it a lot more. So you're welcome to, I highly encourage people to read that uh, if they would like to know more about the framework, right? And so again, this type of thing really is useful because it identifies these problematic design spaces, helps me to categorize games, and then lets me find new gaps and places to design stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on physicality and so really there's like these five different ways I identified that games are using your body uh, to interact with the system uh, that could range from like being directly embodied it. So your whole body's in it uh, to enacting out concepts by moving through the space uh, to manipulating objects, uh, to having some sort of surrogate representation of you that you're manipulating uh, to actually just having some sort of augmented system that you're giving physical input into and it's sort of way abstracting it. Um, and really what this shows is that there are radically different ways we can use uh, phys physically like use our bodies, uh, objects in the world around us to learn. And so if you take away anything from this, that's definitely the key one I want, want people to take away is there's so many different ways we can kind of get at this physicality and this embodiment. Um, so I sort of talked about embodiment. It really draws a lot on like the learning science ideas of like gestural congruency, uh, and how we can use the body to physically represent learning concepts. So in this example, if you were to try and learn about spelling, you would use your body to make the letter Y, right? Everyone remembers YMCA. It's pretty easy to remember the spelling for it because you always do the fun dance moves with it. Uh, so there's lots of like different ways that you're physically encapsulating that. Uh, and so here's a good example. Uh, this is a game called Word Out um, by uh, Paul et al. And they basically have kids learn to spell and like make letters. Uh, by like making their body into the literal uh, letters that they're trying to draw. So in this case, they're spelling like apple and other different words. Um, another example is like enacted. So this is a different type of physicality where it's much more focusing on, on knowing is like physically doing where you're acting out the knowledge into the space. Uh, so I think of it more as like a body in action kind of approach. So if you wanted to learn 
how to draw the letter Y, you would actually walk through the space and draw out the letter Y with the path you're walking, right? And a great example of this type of game is one called Meteor um, by uh, Lindgren, which basically um, you, it's a mixed reality system, top-down projection, all this fun stuff. Uh, and what you're doing is you're like be pretending you're an asteroid. So you actually get on a spring and then you run out into the space and you're trying to simulate how an asteroid would move with your movement. And so it actually like has a little circle following you that tells you how well you're simulating the asteroid uh, and how close you're following it. And you're trying to act out the path that would go through under forces of gravity and other foreign bodies in space. Uh, so that's really enacting out the learning concepts of gravity. Um, manipulation, which is one of my favorite ones, uh, sort of allows for like learning concepts. Uh, you're thinking much more about like tangibles, like physical objects, these types of things, manipulatives. Um, thinking about how you can embed uh, like learning concepts directly into the object itself through its shape, through its materials, through like what you're touching and doing, um, and sort of how you have those objects interact with each other. So what, how you interact and manipulate the objects as well. Um, and so this draws really heavily on these ideas of affordances, which I'm sure everyone's probably heard to death, um, which is really this idea of how the properties of something allow it to be used, right? So there are different types of doorknobs that give you different types of information on how you should play it, right? A teapot has a handle, which tells you you can pick it up. Um, and so, you know, if you have the twisty knob, it's shaped like this. If you have the push down one, it's got a longer handle. So it's telling you physically with this design like this is information that you can pick up and intuitively understand. Um, and affordances are really, really important. Um, and here's a great example I love to show everyone of where they've gone horribly wrong. Um, I don't know how many people, have anyone heard about this before with the, uh, the Apple uh, II building and basically all the staff were running into the walls because they thought it would be much more beautiful to have all the walls be glass. And so no one could see them because all the affordances of a wall was gone. Um, and so there's like a really great example of like why affordances and thinking about them and how people will get information from the physical space and objects is really, really crucial. Um, and so like here's just a common example of like these types of approaches. Uh, this is like a physical blocks game where you actually are moving and placing physical like giant foam blocks in the space. And there's like a, an AR system that's reading the blocks and changing music. And so you actually start to learn how rhythm works and music composition works by how you place the blocks in the space. Uh, so your interaction with them and how the blocks interact with each other gives you a lot of information. Um, another one is sort of this surrogate, which is much more like focusing on that. It's not just a physical object you're manipulating, but you're actually manipulating a, like a representation of yourself, like a mini me. Um, and sort of how you're doing that is you're you're, you're enacting learning concepts with the representation, right? And it gets around some of the limitations of enacted where you need a large space and lots of high-tech monitoring equipment to, oh, I have a small tangible thing and I can move it on a desk and a camera can pick it up. Um, and so you get to enact stuff out with this little surrogate representation of you, right? Uh, so I always love to show this example. Any, ma any Magic the Gathering fans here know who Mitch Richard Garfield is? Uh, that, might, that might be a little bit of a reach, but uh, Richard Garfield basically is like the creator of Magic Gathering. He also made a lot of really interesting like board games um, and things like that. And so this is Robo Rally where you're actually like playing cards and then manipulating a robot. So you've got to program it by how you play the cards so don't go through the space. Uh, and so then sort of this last category of like physicality, it's much more like an abstract uh, like an abstraction of, of the embodiment and the physicality, which I think is most commonly used, um, where we have some sort of representational system. So like, you know, there's an avatar, there's a character in a game, there's like an object in a game that your physical actions are controlling. Um, and you have some sort of augmented feedback system, right? So it's a tablet that has motion sensors, your phone, um, a connect with a TV. Uh, and then you sort of try to embed the learner within that digital system. Uh, and so their physical movements are in some way mapped to this like abstract thing. Uh, and so a good example of this one is, uh, is motion math, which is actually a really great way to kind of learn fractions where you have a tablet and you're, you're actually sort of balancing the tablet. So you're trying to get this object to the different fractions it tells you. So the middle is one half and you're trying to get it to a quarter. And so you've got to try and tilt it to get it to land there. Uh, and so you're physically trying to give them a sense 
it's not as a direct of a mapping as other types of embodiment, but it is having you physically try and, and get learn this content. Right. Uh, and so that's sort of like the different, like five different ways that I, like embodiments I found have been like really commonly used in these types of interactive systems and games. Um, and so uh, what I started to do after that was actually try to apply some of this. So I started wanted to look at like how these design decisions could impact uh, and improve the efficacy of a game. Um, and so I actually chose to explore uh, programming games because there are so many of them. <laughs> And uh, there's a lot of reasons as to why they need to be better explored, which I'll get into uh, in a sec. Um, if you're curious about more on this work, uh, I have several papers on it, uh, including a best uh, paper on we'll mention at Kai um, a couple years ago um, that really kind of summarizes what I'm gonna talk about today or goes into way more detail if you're curious. Um, and so the reason I sort of look at programming games, one, my background is actually computer science. So I'm, more well qualified to sort of teach that, which always helps. Um, but CS education and sort of these related tools like educational programming games are really important, right? We've seen the Hour of Code initiatives gotten really big. Uh, the UK has their Euro Code equivalent, uh, CS for All initiatives, uh, these types of things. Um, and so we know it's important. We talk about how it's important, but we haven't done a lot to actually evaluate how effective these types of games and approaches are. Uh, and so What's interesting about that is that everyone therefore just kind of makes the exact same type of game. The majority of like these existing educational programming games pretty much have all the same sort of design decisions behind them. So uh, when you think about it, it's almost always a robot. People love to have you program robots. Uh, I guess that's just the inner nerd of everyone or whatever reason, but it's almost always a robot that you're thinking about programming. Um, it's also almost always the same genre of game. So it's like usually puzzle-based types of games, um, which is, you know, interesting, but understandable as to why that's like the approach they would take because it's pretty easy to, you know, uh, proceduralize solving a puzzle. Um, the more concerning one, right, is that almost always they're single player games. So they lose out on a lot of like the benefits of collaborative interaction and sort of the, the mutual understanding that can happen uh, when you actually have people work together. Um, and they also just have a really frequently used form of interaction, which is they almost always ever use the keyboard and mouse and less frequently, but fairly commonly the touchpad on like a, a tablet or something. But those are really the only ways you see these educational games uh, in commercially and in use. Um, sort of conversely to that, right? There's been a lot of research saying like, hey, you know, collaboration is pretty useful. Um, and then all this work I've been doing showing like embodiment uh, is a pretty important thing to think about as well, and like how we can physically embody these concepts. So uh, sort of, you know, I wanted to take that idea of like the manipulated, which is a very easy one to sort of work with initially and explore, um, you know, and apply it to building programming games. Uh, and there's sort of a precedence for this. Uh, uh, tangible programming games has been around for quite a while. Uh, so this is actually one of the earliest um, coining of the phrase uh, tangible programming or uh, tangible blocks, um, which is the algo block system um, by Suzuki and Kato, uh, God, long time ago now, 1993. Um, and, you know, more commonly, they've had these systems uh, like the turn, uh, which is this little robot in a science exhibit where you, you program it with tiles. Um, or we've seen the more commercial one, I'm, I'm sure, fairly sure everyone's probably seen Osmo in some capacity. They've been advertising a lot and growing a lot, uh, but they have their, their game called the Obby game, which you're programming a little character to go through a forest. Uh, and so there's a lot of precedence for this, but none of these games like really evaluate, did the tangibles help? <laughs> did they make it better? Uh, and so that's a lot of what I'm trying to look at with this like study, I, uh, upcoming study I'll talk about in a sec that I did. Um, the other idea, right, is collaboration, which I think has been a very long-standing variable of importance for learning. I think uh, we've had mixed feedback on to whether it's useful or not, um, but we can kind of just think about that as probably a useful thing to explore with respect to programming, especially because in programming, we have this concept called pair programming, uh, where people work together and program together, usually a more experienced or less experienced, but sometimes the same level experienced people uh, we'll work on the same set of code together. 
Uh, and there's been work showing that that type of approach actually can improve like student self-sufficiency, performance, uh, and grades when they're all at the same level and working together uh, to program uh, for like these introductory CS courses. Um, and there's also just work showing that when you work with someone, you tend to have a little more fun and be more engaged. Uh, so really what I wanted to do was build an educational programming game that takes these common design characteristics I was talking about earlier, and then have these comparison points for the input methods and the modes of play, right? So did tan would tangible is actually more beneficial to learn concepts like programming uh, and was playing individually or collaboratively more beneficial. Um, and so what I did was I built this game called Bots and Mainframes, uh, where you basically just program a little robot to hit all of the red tiles in a level and you're given a limited number of commands to do it. Uh, this is very common to a lot of like programming game designs. It's the puzzle base uh, with you know uh, a robot theme aesthetic. So I'm not trying to vary on any of those variables, keep those consistent. Um, you can also do things like program it to rotate left to right 90 degrees. Uh, it will stay on the tile it's on and just turn. Uh, and then you can start to do more complicated programming concepts. So if you wanted to add loops in there, you can suddenly now tell it to do a repeated task over and over again. Uh, and so I'll let this one run. Uh, and then you can actually even do functions. So you can have a, a set of commands that you want to abstract and repeat over and over again to solve more complex problems. And so with these, you're actually covering most of the fundamentals that you would get in an introductory programming course uh, with loops and functions really being the key. Uh, and so then what I did was I built the whole set and this was a whole summer. Um, we have a very, very unhappy uh, dissertation defense year uh, the summer before, oh boy. Uh, do, not, do not decide you're gonna paint all your blocks white because if you have to hand paint them, that takes forever. Um, but basically, I built all these physical, tangible representations of the same coding concepts that were in the digital one um, and, and put fiducial trackers on top of them so I could have an augmented reality system track where the blocks are and how they're detected. So it, it sort of looks like this. The player sees the same commands that you would see in the game on the blocks. At the top, there's an overhead camera that's actually seeing a little fiducial markers, uh, which kind of gives you this, this uh, this more um, like numbered code that like it actually, it understands what the, the things are, but no one else will. Uh, and then um, you get a sort of uh, client view, which is some application I'm running in the back end that then tells the game, okay, there are these blocks and they're connected in this order. Uh, and so what happens now is that instead of, you know, using a mouse and keyboard, I take those away and you just chain blocks together. It's actually relatively smooth. Uh, and a lot of participants thought it was like magic kind of happening. It's super fun to run tests with that when you see that. Um, and kind of their expressions are like, whoa, it, it saw the blocks connect. Um, and so you just chain them together, but everything else is the same. Uh, and so thinking about uh, the characteristics of those different types of programming concepts, uh, loops kind of you know, allow you to repeat something. Uh, a certain number of times. So I actually added a slot to the loop blocks. I made them specialized so that they fit another block, but you, I didn't want you to use nested loops because that gets really complicated. So I actually made it so it can only fit regular blocks. Um, and then uh, functions I actually chained together so that you know you can kind of follow the chain of execution and say like, oh, okay, so if I use this, I'm gonna follow this to here and go through it in order. Uh, so trying to physically embody these concepts into the tangibles. Uh, and then I basically ran a, a two by two factorial study um, looking at the input modality and the mode of play and sort of their impacts on uh, various factors uh, with learning, you know, self-efficacy, those types of things. Uh, so I uh, had a pretest where I basically quizzed them on their programming self-beliefs. I then trained them. So they actually, these were all novice programmers that never, you know, programmed before. So they did 10 levels, where, which actually taught them how to program. Uh, then they did a sort of post-test where I asked them, how do you feel about programming now? You know, all your self-beliefs, situational interest, which is really important, uh, enjoyment and repayability. And I gave them a performance task, which was like, can you complete these five levels in 10 minutes? They're different levels and they're much harder. 
Uh, and so basically programming self-beliefs is very similar to the regular concepts of self-beliefs, but you know, with programming kind of added to it. Uh, and so, you know, there's a really nice validated scale uh, that I could take and use. Um, and it sort of has these five core dimensions, which is this debugging self-efficacy, uh, programming self-concept, um, you know, your interest in programming, how anxious you are about programming, and your, your overall aptitude or growth mindset towards programming. So do you think you can get better or worse at it? Or do you think you're stuck? Um, and then sort of these were the training levels. So it, it starts very simple where you're just going forward and then you get more commands. So, and, and then you suddenly learn new concepts. So the first three are just like, here's getting used to the system, move forward, turn the robot left to right, get the mental rotation and translation working. Uh, then you start to use loops, then you start to use functions and then you sort of combine everything uh, so you've got to use loops, functions, and other commands to solve these more complex puzzles. Uh, and so they kind of get increasingly more complex, as you can see by the size of the levels. Um, so then I basically looked at these different factors. Situational interest was another one. Um, and I just want to point out that uh, there's, there's two different types of interest, uh, which probably everyone here is familiar with to some extent. Uh, there's personal interest, which is like, you know, I read programming books because I like programming. I play games because I like programming. Uh, and then there's situational interest, which is much more like the appealing effect of the activity on the individual. It's much more temporary um, and sort of is important because it's like, oh, the interface, this game, the flashy effects, these things kind of got me interested in it. Uh, and what's important about that is that you need situational interest to lead to long-term personal interest. Uh, and so that's really critical uh, to the design of educational tools since it's essential in that way. So we're kind of hooking them in with this situational interest. So better situational interest is really important. Uh, and so then these are the performance levels, uh, much more complicated. You really have to mentally simulate out all of them, um, play through them uh, and kind of figure it out. Uh, and they have varying levels of difficulty with the last two being quite hard. Uh, and so what I did was I ran a convenient sample of just 80 undergrads that, you know, had no more than uh, six months of prior programming experience. Most of them, I think only like two had some, most of them had none. Um, 76 of them were from non-mathematic major, mathematical majors. So really like, you know, less STEM oriented. Um, and participants were sort of randomly assigned to one of the four study conditions. I had to exclude some people depending on, you know, weird things that happened during the test and stuff like that. Uh, so we ended up at 80 uh, with 18 in the individual conditions and 22 in the collaborative conditions. Uh, and so we actually got some really interesting results uh, from this, which is that um, there were a lot of main effects showing that tangibles were way more helpful with programming self-beliefs. Uh, improve their debugging self-efficacy, so their beliefs that they could program or they could debug problems if it happened in their code. Uh, it improved their self-concept, so how they viewed themselves as programmers and could be. Um, it improved their programming interest overall uh, and improved their aptitude, so they felt like they could get better uh, after working with the blocks because it, it seemed to have broken it down for them more intuitively. Uh, interestingly, it had no effect on anxiety but playing collaboratively did, which makes a lot of sense with the sort of prior work with uh, pair programming and things like that, is that working together, it maybe doesn't necessarily help you learn better, especially if you're at the same level, but it does help you feel better about having to program. Uh, and so that's like a really nice kind of takeaway is that tangibles help players feel better about their own programming abilities and increasing their interest in it. Uh, while collaborative play helped pairs to feel less anxious about the overall act of programming. Um, another really interesting result uh, was looking at situational interest, um, which sort of showed that between the two versions of the game, uh, tangibles had way more interest in situational interest for exploration, instant enjoyment, attention demand, and novelty. Uh, and so these sort of things were really quite significant for a couple of them. Um, and seem very, very useful. Um, interestingly, there is no effect in challenge, uh, but actually you would kind of expect that because you wouldn't want the tangible game to feel more challenging than the digital mouse game because of the same game. So there would be something wrong probably if there was a difference in challenge. Uh, so very interesting, the tangibles seem to help a lot more with the situational interest. 
Uh, and then also just looking at, you know, their overall enjoyment and replayability. Um, there is a main effect for tangibles across the board on everything. Um, so, you know, way more enjoyable, wanted to play it again, would definitely want to recommend it to a friend uh, when you use this sort of tangibles based approach. Um, then I started to look at performance and learning. And, you know, initially it just seemed like there wasn't a huge difference. Um, so there was no difference between the conditions, any of them, uh, for the number of levels they completed. However, when you dug a little deeper, there actually was a pretty significant effect for um, making less mistakes when you did the tangible. So people seem to learn it better and more effectively. Um, similarly, and this is kind of an interesting one, when people use the tangibles, they perform faster. Uh, and so this, this uh, plot looks kind of weird, um, but what's actually going on is that people with the mouse were so much faster than when, when they were training and learning the game. And so when you actually control for the speed of using the interfaces and the difference in it, um, even though they look like they took the same amount of time because the tangibles are so much slower to work with, they're actually doing it much faster with way less mistakes. Uh, and so I think a lot of this is that when you have a mouse, it sort of forces, it, it allows you to do this sort of um, trial and error mentality and just like click everything, try everything, like, you know, not think about and reflect as deeply. Um, and when you have the tangibles, it's slower and you actually have to reflect more. Uh, and so that seemed to be really, really beneficial uh, in these sort of performance and learning outcomes as a result. Uh, and so really the overall takeaway was tangibles are awesome, right? And they seem this embodied approach with tangibles into a game seems to be a really, really useful design decision. Um, so collaborative play is also important, but really like tangibles and embodiment seem to be like quite, quite useful uh, in, this, in this context. Um, and so sort of just the last thing I wanted to talk about is that was kind of, uh, you know, interesting work kind of getting into this embodiment. And so I want to talk a little bit more about like moving forward and some more recent work I've done that isn't quite as fully fleshed out in terms of studies and things. Uh, but I built some interesting systems I think people would like to see. Uh, and so, uh, you know, sort of the first thing I started looking at after this work was how you could design educational games that sort of utilize the affordances that our bodies give us. So not just thinking about, um, you know, like the space and, and like simple like sensory motor things, but like actually thinking about the senses. Um, and I'll get to that in a second, but part of why I think that's really interesting um, is then you get to start to look at ideas of like, if you use the body as a controller, you start to lead to these really interesting performative play. Uh, and as of right now, it's pretty much stuck in the space of like independent games and things like that, where it's like you wear costumes, and you do really quirky stuff. Uh, but there's all this really interesting work on how like learning by observing can happen. And I think there's a lot of potential in this space for that type of thing. Um, and so thinking about how that body is a controller can uh, lead to really interesting ideas. Uh, and so what I did was I actually built a game called Mad Mixologist, uh, which thinks about, okay, we're gonna play with the idea of embodiment. Uh, so you have your different senses. Uh, and what Mad Mixologist does is you wear these like cheapo $20 VR headsets. I actually tore out the insides and hooked them up so that they work like augmented reality headsets. Uh, and then they're broadcasting the other person's viewpoint to you. So you're actually playing the game by watching through the other person's eyes. And so the idea is, is that it should help you to empathize more with the other player and develop stronger collaboration skills because you are so much more reliant and directly tied to them because you've literally taken these like embodied affordances and swapped them. So suddenly you have someone else's embodied affordances. Uh, and so kind of playing with that idea is really what I'm thinking about. Uh, and so you actually you get, as you're playing this, you get prompted with instructions uh, and it tells you how to make a physical drink. Uh, and it's a super messy game, great fun. I love to play with this kind of idea of like spectatorship uh, and performative play. Uh, and so that's sort of like one really interesting thing. Um, so now I need to see if I can share the trailer of this and get the, uh, the audio and video to share correctly. So bear with me. So I'm sharing computer sound and optimizing. Okay, so let's see if this works. If it's too loud, let me know and I'll turn it down. Um, but here's the trailer for Mad Mixologist, which is really sort of exploring those intersections of explorative or performative play, spectation, and embodied education. Okay.
Uh, and so that's Mad Mixologist. Uh, it's definitely one of my quirky, weird names, um, but has a lot of, I think, interesting potential for education. We sort of have a paper that's we're writing up and will be in review shortly, uh, looking at just how changing the affordances of the space actually impacts the collaboration in interesting ways. Uh, but since it's not published yet, I can't quite talk about it. Um, but there's some really cool things that are coming out of like swapping sort of these embodied affordances between players and like letting them manipulate in that way. Uh, it's definitely improved a lot since this trailer. That trailer is well over a year old now. Uh, so, you know, optimizations, video pictures better, you know, all this stuff. Um, but that's the general idea of it. It's like this really weird experience where you're looking through the eyes of the other player. Um, and so I got to actually show this at IndieCade uh, 2019, which is like the premier festival for independent games uh, internationally, uh, which was super fun. Um, and, you know, people did so many weird and interesting things when you're put in that kind of space. Uh, the one I always love to highlight is uh, careful when you let kids play your games like this, uh, because man, they do not listen. And there was just, uh, we, we have grenadine, which is if, if people who make drinks are familiar with, it's sort of like a cherry juice and it's bright red and it stains everything. And they are just flinging it. So there's like a good image down there of them just like chucking it across the tables and doing fun stuff like that. Um, and so really entertaining, really interesting how people and even kids are sort of able to understand these affordances and eventually like get through it. Um, and so this is the kind of other part of the work that I think is really interesting is the learning through observing, um, which this type of performative play gets at, which is this idea of games uh, get progressively as you take the body and make it more um, actually encapsulating the ideas uh, and being like embodied, they become uh, progressively more engaging for spectators to watch, right? As you, as you externalize these things from the gameplay into the physical space, it becomes really interesting, right? So you kind of get the classic gamer face, uh, which is, you know, the zombie look. There's really famous articles and pictures of that to the let's play streamers who ham it up for the camera to people that like gather rounds and crowds, to, like watch these really bizarre physical games. Uh, and so this is one called Storm Fight uh, by Ramsey Nasser and Kurt Baig, which is a great example of just the weirdest alternative controller, like physical space game I've ever seen, where you basically have uh, Atari joystick controllers stuck onto the front of the player. And then they are trying to hit the button on top of the other player's controller. Uh, and so it leads to these really awkward, like, um, interesting physical interactions that you would never play individually with a single person that's super weird, but in these performative festive spaces can lead to like really engaging humorous uh, kind of play. And so I think there's a lot of potential in that space for learning. Uh, sort of even more recently than that, uh, I've been uh, looking a lot at sort of how we can also not only augment, you know, with the players bodies and think about the affordances the body gives us, but how we could augment the physical space uh, by sticking tools and things that uh, could actually help build themselves. So really thinking about how could we address like scalability and democratization issues uh, that surround tangible learning environments, right? They're kind of hard to make, they're expensive, um, you know, it makes it very inaccessible in a lot of ways. Uh, and so what I've started to look at is making games that create themselves. Um, which is kind of a weird way to think about it, but you'll get it more when you watch the video. Uh, so this is a game called Generation that I've done uh, recently with my postdoc, Caitlin Grass, Grassy, which is uh, basically looking at how we can incorporate on the fly fabrication of tangibles into tangible learning environments in an effective way. Uh, and so Generation is basically this tool uh, that um, will fabricate pieces as you play the game and you're simulating out evolution as you're playing it. So I'll let the video explain it. It does a better job than me. What if you could play a game to unravel the mysteries of evolution? But not just any game. This is the game of generation, designed to be played using a computer and a 3D printer. The 3D printer is used to fabricate game pieces throughout the game. The player uses these pieces to design gradually more complex creatures. Just like in real life, 
The goal of this game is to survive for as long as possible by adapting to an ever-changing environment. This game is designed to challenge the player with an engaging form of physical play while teaching them about important evolutionary concepts such as natural selection and common descent. Players design creatures using four different printed shapes and have almost complete creative freedom in their designs. They take turns evolving their creature either by rearranging existing pieces or by printing a new piece. The game uses a camera to study the player's creature design and measure four attributes that are important for survival. Attack, defense, speed, and stamina. The player must study the environment and decide which of these attributes will be the most useful for maximizing survival. Just like real life, the game starts simple. But before you know it, some of your neighbors start to change. Here, the game has generated a random new creature made out of two pieces, one pentagon and one triangle. This seems pretty harmless until you realize that what used to be your neighbor has now become your predator. You have to adapt if you're going to survive in this harsh new environment. Your only option at this point is to print a new piece to add to your creature's design. To symbolize the randomness of genetic mutations, the game only lets you choose between one of two random pieces to print each turn. While printing, the game continues to simulate the size of your creature's population over time. When the print is complete, the simulation pauses until you submit your new design. This evolutionary process is repeated until either you or every other organism goes extinct. The longer you play the game, the higher your score. Ultimately, the goal of the game is not to cause all other species to go extinct, but rather to figure out how to coexist with them without destroying the balance of the ecosystem. Uh, and so that's generation, uh, and it's, it's basically using 3D printers to fabricate the pieces as you play. Um, and we're doing all sorts of really interesting design optimizations and things to figure out how to print these efficiently and at a speed that actually could afford interactivity and learning in a game without being boring. Uh, and so there's some really interesting design challenges here for learning uh, that we're trying to address with this. Um, and this was recently accepted uh, and presented at uh, Kai Play, which is sort of one of my home venues for, for games in HCI. Uh, and so that's pretty much the, the gist of this work I've been doing, um, trying to understand embodiment and how we can incorporate it to improve and build better games in general, but specifically educational games. Uh, so if you're interested in working with me or collaborations, I always love that kind of thing. Feel free to reach out or follow me on Twitter even. Um, and yeah, I'll open it up to any questions if you have any. Thank you. Thanks so very much, Eddie. Gosh, this mixology um, feels like it must be five o'clock somewhere, right? <laughs> oh, four o'clock. Yeah. Uh, so, so let's let's see what. Uh, I mean, I have some questions, but let's see uh, what what the crowd wants to ask. Give people a few seconds. Uh, just lift your hand and speak out. Is that a half a hand, Zoe? Go for it. Thank you so much. I um, am not in the, the CS or STEM ed world, but, uh, the, but fascinating. Um, and um, yeah, thank you so much. I, I'm curious about the um, about um, kind of ethical implications of games that involve um, kind of empathetic imagination in someone else's shoes or like literally seeing through someone else's eyes. And I'm thinking about some art projects um, there was a VR project at LACMA a few years ago where um, museum visitors were invited to experience um, uh, kind of the, the, a harrowing journey crossing the, the border um, between the United States and Mexico. And I think there, there are a lot of questions about, about that. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, just, I'm curious kind of uh, what, what you are thinking kind of ethically. Um. Yeah, that's that's a, a great question. Um, whew, uh, basically, um, I feel like serious games have a lot of potential and just educational, but really, I guess the serious games is where that falls, um, have this really amazing potential as empathy machines. Um, and I think that there's, you always have to be a little careful on how you 
sort of stick people into and what you stick them into. Um, just sort of the discomfort you can put them in. Uh, you think about like body dysmorphia and things like that. There's all sorts of weird things that can happen. Um, and I also think that like, the, but these games also have really amazing potential to like address ethical issues. Um, and so like, I saw a really great one at Games for Change uh, a year or two ago where it, it like put you through the lives of like uh, a black family um, who had like gone through a traumatic event recently and these types of things. And so they have this amazing potential uh, to develop empathy. Um, I think that you just, there's always a really tricky balance that you have to do with like the discomfort of sticking someone in someone else's shoes and, and being responsible about that kind of thing. Hopefully that answered it to some extent. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe I'll go ahead with a question. I'll see what sparks other people. So uh, it, it's just so interesting to be within this general nexus of practice uh, of learning scientist, uh, HCI folks. and. And we do come from, I mean, you've helped me see here, recognize we do come from somewhat different paradigms and we have somewhat different objectives and different conceptualizations or sensitivities of sensibilities of what is what is a project, what is about and where, where, where might it go. And, um, I, and, and I speak as a guy, a learning scientist who, who dabbles in, right, in creating frameworks. And, and, and I, I wondered what, if you could characterize what for you is the role of theory, theory of learning, research on learning with, within, within your practice. I'll, but by way of example, you know, you, uh, you started out by asking, okay, here's something I want people to learn. And I want to design like what, and the, the, there's that black box. So I wondered if you, to what extent you've opened that 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 black box? Because um, can you tell us, for example, why not, not just that that something worked, right? You show effect that things mm -hmm. work, but how about process? Like, why do things work? And do you even maybe do you even see a role for a, a, a person like you in in contributing back to theory of learning, either by corroborating or expanding or, or challenging or somehow contributing back to theory, which is a way within the learning science with a design based research. That's kind of the, the meat and potatoes. That's the way that we, we think. So I know it's a big question, but I'm, I'm just really <laughs> curious. Yeah, I know that's a fantastic question. Um, so I'll kind of break that into parts. I, I, I see the role of theory is actually relatively critical um, in, in games and sort of the design of them. I actually think that there's a pretty fatal flaw in, in the work, in most of the work within games research. Don't go tell them I said that. Um, but uh, that, that we, it tends to be that people steal games and take them and put them in their own home disciplines. And so they, they don't think about how other disciplines can inform games. Uh, and so I think this is where the role of sort of learning science theory is really, really critical is that we can actually like, work on the game domain, but apply these learning science theories, not just for educational games, but for like how we anticipate a player to learn how to play a game, how we anticipate them to like pick up and understand a tutorial or an interface. Uh, these types of like learning science actually could really in, inform like game design as, as a whole. Uh, and that's sort of a lot of my work is trying to take that and put it in. Uh, and then I think this is exactly what you're talking about is how you give it back. Um, I, I really wish I had, had uh, stuck an extra slide in here because there's some work that I've done that I, I never got around to publishing that specifically looked at the process in, in that, that bots game. Uh, and I actually like, you know, hand coded like how people were interacting with the tangibles, what they were doing in the space, all these things, and was able to show that it wasn't just that the tangibles were like, you know, magically better. It's actually that um, it, it forced them to debug less, but to, to think more. So they actually did more actions that were like algorithm building based uh, or more actions that were like discussing and simulating what was gonna happen before they ran it. So they had a better mental model before they even went into actually running and seeing what the code did. 
Uh, and I think that was actually the key into why the tangibles are so successful is because they spent so much of their process on the, the building and the simulating rather than just let's quickly put it in there, see what happens and then try and figure out what went wrong. And I actually think I see this a lot because I teach intro programming classes uh, with my intro programmers is that they tend to just like jump in there, write a bunch of code, run it, nothing works, get disappointed and leave. Uh, and so I think there's so much that like, um, that this type of work can inform the process. Uh, I still have not quite cracked that nut into how to get into learning science more and collaborate. Uh, That's why I love talking at stuff like this to actually find collaborators to kind of help me um, more with that since my background is CS and HCI. Uh, and I'm just not as competent when it comes to, you know, getting, getting into the, the learning science field and publishing there. Uh, but I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff that can be taken from, we've made these novel design decisions. Let's really look at how that's impacting the process and take it back into learning science to really inform some of these theories. Because it applies it basically in very interesting ways. Same question, but on the flip side, yep. Yeah. Uh, Fame, are you please? Hi, it's good to see you again. Um, uh, yes, good to see you. From the opposite side of door asking about theory, I'm interested um, thinking a little bit more about practice and integrating games in the classrooms. And you talk about um, teaching intro to programming. So maybe this is true for some of your students too. I'm curious, how do you think we can help people start to think about embodiment and ways that they can create games themselves that incorporate different modes of physicality? So um, if you remember, I work with Yvonne Arroyo a lot and she has a WLCP. So we're trying to help teachers and support teachers to make their own games. And we're providing mm -hmm. them with a wearable technology, but the incorporation of embodied components is not as organic as we expected it to be. So have you come across this or do you have any ways that you think may be um, a good start to helping other people consider ways that they can make their games more wearable and embodied and um, mm -hmm. more active? For sure. Uh, that's actually exactly why I was starting to do that generation research because it sort of allows to provide like fabricating these sort of embodied affordances in real time and provide them as you need in customized ways. Um, but I think that's kind of inaccessible at this moment, right? That's sort of with the anticipation in 10, 15 years, 3D printing is actually going to be fairly ubiquitous and cheap. Um, but we're not there yet, right? This is like very far projecting. Um, I think one thing that could help a lot with that, because I, I know like when using these sort of embodied elements, it's kind of hard to like understand how to interact with them is what I've seen a lot as like, oh, it, they have affordances and things, but you've got to like provide a rule set or some sort of guidance to really help them learn. Uh, and one thing I've, I've always seen or thought about that would be helpful for this type of thing is playground games. So thinking about like yard, like school yard games, playground games, these outdoor games that are purely analog, uh, but provide a rule system that kids tend to play and follow. And I think those types of things actually have a lot of potential in terms of just informing the design of like making purely analog embodied systems that like teachers could use. Because uh, if you frame it more in that kind of physical activity, I think it'd be really helpful. I, I saw an interesting one all called, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to blank on it. I think it's Earthquake Room or something like that. A uh, Roomquake, that's the name of it. Um, and, and they basically taught kids how to do triangulation of earthquakes um, by having them run around the room with giant things of string to triangulate it. So they'd say an earthquake happened and they tell them kind of where, and then they let them go and play and actually like run and do the physical things. But the guidance of those sort of rules for the play really seemed to help. Uh, when they were talking about the design of their system. So that's sort of what I always think about it is, is maybe taking more of like a, a play approach with like a playground kind of game or something like that can help frame how you should pick up and use the physical affordances and tangibles. That's a great perspective. Thank you. You're welcome. Eddie, if I, if I were to go back, back to that um, uh, proverbial black box and, mm -hmm. and ask you, you started out by uh, sharing your uh, classification of what people mean when they say embodied in, this, in these contexts. And 
so at the end of the day, having done these projects and others that uh, that you've been engaged in the past few years, what uh, how might if 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 there's some concept you want to teach, how might you choose among the various these various things? You know, just by way of example, I know some colleagues of mine, the kind of coming from the Vanderbilt uh, school, like uh, start with Rogers Hall at the time with uh, Ricardo Nemirovsky, but then Joyce Ma, and, um, they have these participatory simulations that are very much uh, full body and right and 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 Fogelstein's work with Olympics and, and like walking in your neighborhood or walking in the city and they say well here we are I guess you'd call that maybe enacting in that full body mm -hmm. and then um, again coming back to theory they, like so what did they learn and and should I choose that way or the other way mm -hmm. like how should I choose what what, <laughs> what way to go yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, and that's actually a major limitation of a design framework is it, it tells you what's there and it kind of tells you these are interesting spaces to look at, but it doesn't tell you which choice to make. Um, and, and I think that's where a lot of role of theory can play. Um, and that's actually something where me personally in like my design of systems, when I've made these sort of decisions, I actually think about a concept called learning mechanics, uh, which is how you embody the, the learning into a game mechanic. So when you're making body. a game, yes. Uh, and so the idea is, is that I actually came up, I have this term, I, I, I sort of published on it, uh, called embodied learning mechanics, which is like how you're embodying the content in the learning mechanics of the game. Um, and so when I think about it, I think about what I call strong or weak embodiment, which is, is how well sort of the physicality of the activity is congruent with the learning concept. So I, I think there's some things that like, you know, using blocks are great for that, that, um, you know, whole body would not be great at. Um, I, I think you wouldn't want to use tangibles to, uh, well, you wouldn't want to use tangibles to teach, um, what would be a good one? Something like gravity, because it's just really hard to kind of simulate that with the physical as much as it is to like run around the whole body. Uh, but you could probably think of ways to design it. Um, so when you're designing, it's really just thinking about like how well you're integrating the physicality and the affordances, like with the learning content. So if, if it's just like, you know, I stuck, uh, the build sounds a great example, like trying to teach music, but you're using physical blocks that it reads and you combine to make a composition, maybe not as effective as other ways, like actually mapping your body movement to sound. So there, there's a, a really great one called, um, uh, sound the maker sound space or something like that by Alyssa Antle, um, where the player's movements are actually mapped to it. And I feel like that's just a much more like fast, um, intuitive way of mapping that sort of embodiment and that sort of learning content to like, I move my arm up or down, it changes the volume. I'm changing the rhythm by like moving faster or slower versus like putting a block down which removes me from sort of the learning content. And it's, and I'm not really learning from the block. It's kind of how I connect them. It's just much weaker. So I, I try and think about like, what, what is, how strongly can I represent something? What's the most strong, like the strongest way to actually show it in the embodied content, uh, which is tricky. It, it's sort of at this point, I call an art, <laughs> um, but I, I feel like with more theory and like work trying to tie that down, we may have a stronger way of understanding when it's appropriate to apply something or not. A colleague of mine within the mathematics education world called Dave Pratt, who works with uh, Richard Moss. He has this idea, he's talked about um, the long word phenomenalization. Hmm. Like to phenomenalize something. It, he speaks about the initial work a designer does when you consider some concept you want to teach and sort of introspecting and saying, how does that feel for me? Like, what, what is this? How do I, right? It's a mm -hmm. certain kind of first person micro phenomenology introspection work you do, which starts giving you uh, some sense of how this might uh, materialize into objects and activities. And I, and I think that's something that is still needs to be uh, demystified as Donald <laughs> Sherman. Uh, For sure. 
yeah. we, we actually have one in HCI. We call it body storming, which is the exact same thing. Um, and it's it's a total mystery. <laughs> it's just, you know, what all do you, intuition. What do you do, what do, you yeah. do in body storming? That- um, you basically kind of act out the physical things you're going to do and pretend and, and try and get an intuitive sense of what it's going to feel like and do to give you insight to like how you should design it. Um, so it's, it's very similar. Um, and it's the same kind of like luck, intuition, having a lot of experience doing this kind of physical interactions to like, know this is going to work or not, but you, you basically simulate it out with blocks or moving through the space and pretend. Yeah. yeah. It's actually interesting. We can come up with uh, flow charts. I've <laughs> made some of these, like take the concept, this is what you do. And I, I just don't know if it, if it really works. I just, uh, there's, I think there's a, uh, it's an interesting frontier, this whole, this place of, uh, Introspection, microphenomenology. Mm-hmm. So where are we, Lloyd? Any, uh... um, seeing any other questions, but perhaps somebody has something on their mind. Um, maybe, maybe Eddie. Maybe you can just give us some sense of uh, if somebody steps up and says that was so cool. Let's. I'm a learning scientist. Hi, let's collaborate. <laughs> what, what, what kind of work do you do you foresee doing? What kind of what uh, flavor of research are you hoping to achieve in such collaborations? Yeah, for me, I think I'm really interested in in more and getting into understanding the process. Uh, so a lot of my work is on the design side. So I think about you know these designs, what effects they have. But um, I don't spend as much time like focusing like on kind of what's going on um, while they're learning. Like I do intuitively as I watch and that's all my designer intuition, but it's not like my actual like work as a learning scientist. And so I think what would be really interesting to me is like working with someone to be like, oh, okay, let's, I can build these systems to explore these interesting ideas with theory let's actually pair up to look at how they're impacting and relating and actually doing what we expect or not, and then form that theory further. And I think that's where like working with a learning scientist would be really interesting is in that kind of way. Uh, or just uh, for me, I love making designing games to solve problems. Uh, so if there's specific content that you're trying to teach that's difficult, like conceptually hard or you know tricky, like some things are more concrete or abstract to learn, uh, conceptually. Uh, and then that's something that I could see as also being a great way to collaborate. It's like, okay, well, I can kind of work with you to design a system that teaches this very strange concept or like, you know, or just a, a regular concept, but we want to look at it with this different type of design. Uh, and I think that's the sort of thing where it's like, I want to check these two types of embodiment uh, where there could be some really interesting uh, overlap as well. I find that in my collaborations with the HCI folks, like, uh, you know, Kimiko over here, Kimiko Ryokai. Oh, or, yeah. Yeah, or with uh, my museum partnerships, etc. I find that what hooks me as a learning scientist, what hooks me into collaboration is in, like video data of people learning. Like, mm. look and say, what the heck? What? Like, I ask myself, what is this a case of? Like, I'm, I'm seeing stuff happening and what theories can I bring to bear in order to explain what this thing is here that is happening, right? Such yeah. as when people are mixing their seeing from other perspectives, like I say, oh, what is this? And by what is this, I mean, how can I classify this in terms of some kind of models that I'm familiar with? How can I characterize this? And so I think uh, I'd recommend you, uh, you know, show, show colleagues video data. That's kind of when you get excited. Interesting. Oh, I have abundances of video data. Uh, and there is so much I'm trying to figure out with how to like assess that mad mixologist game in, in particular, uh, just because it, it, it's all video data and I just record it all. Uh, and so we've looked at some of like how you play with the space and stuff. But yeah, man, anything like that with theories that inform better what's going on, because uh, it's so much harder from my perspective when I'm sort of using these validated measures to assess something like, um, you know, co-presence, yeah. uh, which I was looking at with the mad mixologist thing, and I'm not getting it. And I can't figure out like what it is I'm looking at wrong. Maybe it's a process thing. So these models, I, I feel like would help so much 
and just sort of what's, un what's understanding what's really going on there. One of the things that the data do with uh, when you have these like surprising designs is they, they problematize for you your own perspectives on how, pe how people behave, how they think, what they do. Because it's, for instance, with, I mean, the, the vision is, is a case of that in that it, it problematized perception. And so by so doing, you get to, um, you get to, to, to surface your own implicit assumptions about the way that people people are because we're sort of, kind of de decomposing <laughs> that and fragmenting it in, in bizarre ways.